Peter. Mohammed, stay close. In the meantime, thanks very much. Well, Phyllis Bennis is a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies. She joins us live now from Washington. Phyllis Bennis, welcome back to the news hour here on Al Jazeera. Is this calm? Is this a truce or is it just a chance to reload? Well, it's important that they use the word calm and not the word peace. There has been no peace in Gaza for many, many decades. And I think what we're seeing right now is a moment of hesitation. It may be that the firing has slowed and Israel doesn't yet want to acknowledge that. It's a little hard to know, as we just heard from Mohammed on the ground. Uh, we know that there have been extraordinary rhetoric uh, escalations throughout the day. The Minister of Education, Naftali Bennett, one of the furthest right of this right-wing cabinet, uh, had called earlier today for the Israeli snipers on the Gaza fence to fire at, directly at the children who are launching some of these kites. And it was the chief of the army, the chief of the Israeli army came back and said, I can't accept that. It, and he s indicated he believed it was not a moral position. And despite that, the Minister of Education called again uh, for essentially killing Palestinian children. So there's this incredible level of, of rhetorical escalation underway. And we know that the position of the Israelis for some time has been to anticipate a more significant attack that would be even more deadly than the 2014 war, which left over 2,100 Palestinians dead. So in that situation, I think if there is a ceasefire that holds briefly, it will not hold for very long, I'm afraid. Clearly, if Hamas is going to run with this, in effect, they have to cap the simmering tensions that have been on display for the past two months within Gaza. Therefore, how do they sell this calm domestically? I think that the irony, what we're seeing here, is that the Palestinians for 17 weeks now have been launching extraordinarily nonviolent protests every Friday afternoon at and near the fence. Those protests from the very first one, from even before the first one, the Israelis announced that those nonviolent protests would be met with brutal force, that they were going to send in the sharpshooters, the snipers, which they did. The snipers have now killed over 150 people throughout that period, more than 50 on one day, on May 14th, uh, on a day that over 2,000 Palestinians were injured, mostly by live fire. And there seems to be a position on the, from the Israeli military and the political echelon that says, we have enough confidence that we will get absolute impunity from the Trump administration. And in that context, we're not afraid of being held accountable for international law. So we can go ahead and announce ahead of time, we plan to violate international law. We plan to use sharpshooters and snipers against civilians who are not threatening any people, a direct violation of international law. And so far, they have been right. They have not been held accountable. Is the reaction to that, though, on the other side of the Gaza-Israel border something of a dichotomy, if you will, in as much as the right of return march organizers have undoubtedly unified the people on the ground? We've seen eight weeks of the videotapes of that. We've seen the reaction to right. the handiwork, if you will, of the sharpshooters. And yet there's unity on the ground. But the, the politicians within Hamas, the politicians within Gaza, they are not in step lock when it comes to their reaction to this. They may not be. But I think what's important is that the population of Gaza seems to be following the lead of the civil society activists who first called for the great march of return. Uh, this was not Hamas who made this call. This, these were activists uh, in the community who said, enough. We have to do something. And what they chose to do, rather astonishingly, when you think about the conditions in which they live uh, in this outdoor prison without sufficient access to medicine, to electricity, to clean water, to anything like that, the United Nations says that Gaza will be uninhabitable by 2020. That's less than two years away. So in that context, what's extraordinary is that the population has followed the lead of those who have called for nonviolent protests. And they have been met with more and more violence, with more and more young people being killed. And I think in that situation, uh, it's likely to continue. I think there probably will be children who 
uh, who send these, these little burning kites over the fence when they can. It's a symbolic gesture. Yes, there has been some property damage, and that's unfortunate, but it's the consequence of the decades of occupation. Gaza remains occupied despite the withdrawal of troops and settlers from the territory of Gaza. That has been replaced by a siege in which Gaza is completely surrounded by Israeli troops who control the airspace, the waters, control electricity and lack of electricity, make sure that there is no viable economy. So in those conditions, this kind of nonviolent resistance is actually rather astonishing that it has held this long. Is it astonishing, perhaps, because of the reality here? Because some of those people that organize the march, they say, look, we simply cannot do a war at the moment. We can't afford a war. And if we look at the broader issues, the broader picture here, when you talk about the years of occupation, if we look at it in the context of Nakba, for example, this, as far as Israel is concerned, is heading to what the Palestinians can never accept. It is the ultimate humiliation, I guess. That, that, that's the best word for this. I think that's one of many words. Uh, I think that you're right that this is leading the Israelis, the recognition that Palestinians are starting to get support globally at a level that they have never had to face before, that Israel has never had to face before. One of the consequences of that has been the new law that was passed just yesterday in Israel that makes the apartheid that had been a characteristic of Israeli rule over Palestinians, both inside Israel proper and in the occupied Palestinian territory, it's now legal. It's sort of equivalent to 1948 in South Africa when the practices of separation, the practices of apartheid, the practices of discrimination were for the first time legalized into the legal system of apartheid. Israel has now announced the same thing. The recognition of Arabic as a second language no longer exists. There is no longer even the pretense of Israel as a, quote, Jewish and democratic state. Democracy has been abandoned in favor of privileging the Jewish majority. So in this situation, I think that Israel is very, very worried about nonviolent responses from the Palestinians that win Palestinians support from all around the world, governments and people. So in that situation, I think they're trying very hard to provoke a more violent response from the Palestinians, which would give them, in their view, if not the right, at least some kind of political cover for launching an even greater, more deadly uh, war against Gaza. Phyllis Bennis, always good to talk to you and get your insight. Thank you so much.